Well, welcome to Bioethics Grand Rounds. Our topic today um, is crisis standards of care for children and pregnant people. Um, I'm your moderator today. I'm Naomi Laventhal. I'm a neonatologist here at Michigan Medicine, and I'm also a faculty ethicist at the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine. So just a few bits of housekeeping. We don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose any of us. There is um, one, in, one funding disclosure that you'll see in an individual speaker's presentation. So what we're going to do, we have we have a short amount of time to do a lot of great things. And in, in speaking with these panelists, if I'd had the option, I would have made this a half-day meeting. They're really going to bring some interesting perspective. But I'll introduce and frame the topic just a little bit and introduce our speakers um, with a briefer uh, introduction than they probably deserve. And then our, our panelists will go in this order. They're each going to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. And then whatever time we have remaining, we'll use for a uh, question and discussion that I'll moderate. So crisis standards of care, this is a term that, that many of us weren't using two years ago. It's something that suddenly is everywhere and we talk about quite a bit. And as, as you know, we mostly talk about this in the context of COVID. And I think generally what comes up is sick adults with severe COVID disease. Um, and the kinds of images that I've shown here, I think are the ones that we all got used to seeing, uh, particularly in the spring of 2020, when we thought about not enough hospital beds for all the sick patients, not enough ventilators for all the sick patients, not enough people to take care of those sick patients. And these images were everywhere, including this, um, this, this setup for a field hospital in the Cobo Center in Detroit. Um, so th there are some formal definitions for this as we think about what is, what is surge capacity? What does that mean? And generally, when we think about taking care of patients, we need space, we need people, and we need stuff. And those are the things that have to come together. And as the need for those things start to increase, first we start talking about stretching the way we do things, but providing care in the same way. And then we talk about crisis capacity, where we start to have to adapt the way we use space people and stuff um, that isn't consistent with our usual standards of care, but that provides sufficient care in the context of the disaster that we're dealing with. And the, the idea here is to provide the best possible care we can, given the circumstances and resources that we have available. And this is one of my favorite descriptions of this. It's, it's described as a graceful degradation of the services to the minimum degree needed to meet the demands um, while maintaining the maximum patient and provider safety. So today we're really gonna get into talking about how we do this, but instead of talking about adults with severe COVID disease in ICUs, we're gonna talk about a few other things which are either directly or indirectly related to the pandemic. Um, and this takes in a few flavors. One thing that we learned during the pandemic is that children were incompletely captured by some of the resource allocation frameworks that were developed. And we learned about the limitations of which sort of the general society might even appreciate how sick children can be and what resources they might need. We're also going to talk about the, the, the thorny issue of elective surgeries and the broad meaning of elective and, and hear about what happens when we put off surgeries that at least at the time that they were scheduled were elective. We'll talk about this summer's huge obstetric surge that our institution and many others faced um, with record numbers of women coming in for delivery. And we'll talk about nursing staff shortages as they've impacted some of this care. So, so from here, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Um, you'll first hear from Dr. Marie Lozon, who's a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics. And her specialty, she's, she's, she's what in her circle they refer to as a disasterologist. And she really works on pediatric disaster preparedness, which is a very specific and important niche. So she's also the chief of staff of Michigan Medicine. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Roger Smith, who's an associate professor in obstetrics and gynecology. And, and his expertise is really in quality of safety in safety. And as a neonatologist, I've come to appreciate that work that he does as one of the um, M plan partners for Von Voigtlander and who really led us through that obstetric surge. And then we'll hear from Dr. Carly Pfeiffer, who's a longstanding member of the Pediatric Ethics Committee. She's a pediatric uh, cardiologist. She's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, and she uh, has dual expertise both in fetal cardiology and in pediatric critical care. So each of these speakers will present their own slides. Like I said, they'll each speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then I'll moderate a discussion at the end. So here's that QR code one more time before I take down the slide deck and let Dr. Lozon share. I'll let folks QR for a moment and I'll put up my deck and put that into presentation mode and get rid of all these crazy floating controls. 
And here we go. And I hope uh, uh, Naomi, give me a head nod if you can hear me okay. Hear me okay? Good. Hi, I'm Marie Lozon. I'm the Chief of Staff of Michigan Medicine, which is my day job. And um, my other day job is to work on behalf of um, children and disasters, which I've done for many, many years. I just want to touch on disaster ethics and where are we with this crisis standards of care specifically for children? And I would, I'm would, i going to tell you the, the answer to the question before I even get started. We're not that far along. Um, we're trying to get there. We're trying to think about that. I have no disclosures or any conflicts, except that I'm grant funded to help prepare for better uh, children's um, needs in disasters by the by HRSA and by ASPR, which, which is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. And I work on trying to make sure Michigan, most specifically, but the whole FEMA 5 region, which is the Great Lakes, and the country and internationally are prepared for disasters. And um, many folks never heard of such a crazy thing as CSE or crisis standards, maybe until COVID. I've been working on this for many years with the state of Michigan um, and with our institution. And um, 10 years ago in Danto Auditorium, we were thinking about what would happen if H1N1 became uh, worse than it was and we actually had to ration care. And there were uh, many dozens of us there, um, probably 80 or 90 providers, nurses, ethicists, uh, people from the state to think about what we would do if we had to, as an institution, invoke crisis standards. This was a tabletop exercise. And even in the worst parts of COVID, I was in the command center quite a bit during the beginning of COVID. Command went up March 11th. Uh, 2020 and command closed in June. We were, I think we were up for 104 days and we are still in a command posture. We still uh, think about crisis standards. In fact, Naomi and I and, and Andy uh, Schumann and others have a meeting right after this to continue to talk about our scarce resource allocation. But we this past month have been reading in the New York Times that Alaska had to ration care and that people died because of that. And this physician, this was a gut-wrenching story because it brought it home to me of uh, what it would be like to make those decisions. And it's very seldom that you actually have this on the front page of the paper where they're, they're admitting they went into crisis standards and those decisions were made. Idaho uh, was starting to ration. Utah stood up crisis standards or came close to it, and so did Arizona. And I'm throwing up the, the putative definition again. Uh, Naomi already did it, but people started to publish on this. The National Academies of Medicine or Institute of Medicine, which now is the National Academies of uh, Science, Engineering and Medicine, started to publish on this in the 2000s um, after 9-11 and after Katrina um, to think about um, codifying this on a national level. And, you know, they they tried very hard to come up with frameworks that individual states and even individual institutions would really take up and try to formalize for, for their care delivery. But um, it's been spotty. People don't actually know if their institution has a crisis standard document. You're supposed to have one, but many don't. And then there's the reluctance. This is what I call the political piece. Um, in the very early part of the COVID pandemic, um, those of us who remember what was going on in New York, there's an article in The Atlantic. In fact, um, Matthew Winia, who's a colleague of ours uh, at the Center for Bioethics um, in Colorado, uh, is quoted in this um, Atlantic article. Uh, it was chaos and crisis standard declaration was not made and folks didn't know what to do. So they kind of they kind of worked on the ground and just did what they had to do. They couldn't wait for anybody to stand this up. They had to make decisions on the ground. So because um, often politicians are not willing to uh, declare crisis standards, uh, physicians themselves or centers themselves have to have to do this. And so during the midway through the COVID, uh, the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, this, uh, the uh, Institute of Medicine, National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine folks, this same group who always publishes on disaster ethics, these names, John Hick, Dan Hanfling, uh, Eric Toner and Matthew uh, Wania too, really started to think about um, how have we changed in our crisis standard posture or thinking since 
maybe to the 2000s when we first started writing about this and what about equity because and equity in all these domains nomenclature surge coordination clinician roles triage process what about equity and this was a a clearly a um a hot button issue and this is a very thoughtful discussion paper about this issue that many of us who deal with disaster ethics have have read and taken to heart and i do want to um credit matt Winia, uh with this this graceful degradation of care. Back in the day, we in 2009, when this was published on the left hand side, and I'm sorry for the teeny tiny print, it's really not important except to say in 2009, when the National Academies published this, they said, okay, here's a grid, space staff stuff, conventional contingency crisis. That's how you do CSC. Well, as we saw, those of us who lived in the COVID pandemic saw that things every day things popped up that today was the crisis was dialysis and those of us that served on the scarce resource allocation committee know that during the worst part of the uh spring and into the summer of um of april or you know march and april 2020 we ran out of dialysis machines and had to do short runs of hemo dialysis instead of crrt we had to create a whole um rubric on how we were going to serve these dialysis patients um, at least a little bit, we were in contingency standards. So it's become clear that it's um, uh, it's not necessarily a, this entire whole cloth crisis, but it might be a crisis of one thing. It might be respiratory therapists are, are scarce on the ground. So delivering CPAP or respiratory care, it's not the ventilator, it's not the machine. And those of us who've been doing this know it's not gonna be the machine, it's gonna be the staff. Um, so is it more thoughtful? to start thinking about different resources and this degradation far ahead of time. Um, have your, your rubric for how you're gonna degrade dialysis support or respiratory support far ahead of time. Yes, that probably is the duty to plan that I talk about all the time at the state level. We have to have a duty to plan. And I will beat to death a little bit the uh, inequities that were laid bare by COVID, the difficulty getting the needed items, monoclonals, testing, vaccine by some groups, um, using race as a prioritization for, uh, for vaccines ended up being controversial. Social vulnerability index was advocated by the CDC in terms of re rethinking and revisioning your scarce resource allocation plans, but that was challenged sometimes. And all the issues about ageism, ableism, and the language of medical futility, it is concerning to assume medical futility or assume the quality of life of this person is not as good as this person. Therefore, we have to eliminate them from the care pathway in order to save resources. So these were things that we we really started to grapple with. And the politics, the this reliance on a formal declaration to stand up. And this is where some states made their formal declaration. Other states, they left the institutions on their own. Um, we never had a formal declaration of this in Michigan. And I can tell you there were some times we may have needed it, although we got through because of some good information sharing. So sometimes hospitals rely for their legal cover on state declarations, but we learned how to manage um, without state action. We managed our PPE without having a state action. Um, only Arizona and New Mexico formally declared uh, but they left the implementation up to individual facilities. So not very helpful. Okay, you're in crisis standards now, figure it out. Uh, but uh, Alaska and, and Idaho declared as well, and I showed you the, the New York Times article from Alaska, they really had to make some, uh, what I think were awful triage decisions. And it, it's always the thing you don't think it is. If it's a respiratory issue, we thought this would be a respiratory disease where we'd run out of ventilators, et cetera. It was really dialysis and staff and ECMO um, that we ran out of. And we had to do very crazy implementations to spread it thin. But um, but did we ever declare in our, in our um, command center that we were in crisis standards? I would say we were in contingency a lot, but never in crisis. So, um, planning by resource as opposed to saying everything's in crisis and being nimble about that, that graceful degradation that uh, Naomi referred to, that's probably a better uh, approach. And as far as children, um, I'm here to think about 
crisis standards for children. And I'm involved in two uh, consortia of research persons trying to make it better for kids in disaster. We're called Eagle or Eastern Great Lakes. And then there's a group out west, RAPM, which is the Western Regional Alliance. That's Arizona, California, um, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. And these two groups were charged by uh, ASPAR to come up with ways to make disaster planning better for kids. And that includes thinking about how we're going to include children as we plan for crisis standards in a, in a large scale event, either a mass illness, a pandemic, et cetera. And you know what? Um, this has been very painful because nobody has, and I very much apologize for this crazy busy slide, and I'll kind of go through it a little bit. If you go out there and say, okay, who's got an algorithm, a rubric, a rule book for how to triage who gets to have the resource when you are in crisis standards and it's for children. Very few people have, have actually put this on paper at the state level. Um, this is for, from Northwest Healthcare Response Network in the state of Washington. They actually have a checklist and a rubric, an algorithm. You see the arrows, you see the Visio type. Uh, where if you are a child and you have you have ne critical care needs, they and they are in crisis standards, they are to run through a decision tree um, and think about how they are going to deliver care. And one thing I want to quote my friends um, uh, from the West Coast who hosted a crisis standards for children webinar said, we are never going to de uh, deny a child care. We don't abandon these patients. We don't abandon the children. It's, it just may not be the perfect um, full, you know, standard ICU care that, that we would do in normal times. But they literally put themselves out there. They have a checklist to continue, continually reassess the child as the scarcity continues and go back to the data and go through their algorithm. This was published in December 2020 um, in the midst of COVID to prepare. And so if you have severe trauma, or pre-existing encephalopathy, vegetative state, or severe underlying abnormalities, they actually put it out there that certain kids should be um, recommended for a palliative um, care situation. And this is a rare event. No, no crisis standard documents generally will share this or say this about children. Um, at least this is a start to have the conversation. And um, this is bold but it's at least getting kids in the rubric. And the flip side is guaranteeing that maybe they are thought about when, when um, thinking about, oh, let's say, should we keep an ECMO circuit available for that baby that's gonna be born with congenital diaphragmatic hernia and not give away all the ECMO circuits to the respiratory patients? That's a complicated discussion to have in a health system. So how do we not get there? that my, my sort of life's work is don't get to crisis standards, avoid it by load leveling. You know, there's three full service children's hospitals in the state of Michigan, three. Yes, there are other places that take care of children, Beaumont, Sparrow, Covenant, um, but it's us, it's DeVos, it's D uh, the DMC for very complex patients. And on everyday basis, they pick up the phone and say, Marie, can you send the helicopter? We cannot do that. We have to learn how to surge. We have to learn how to coordinate our data and be transparent and know at any given time where, these ch where the children's assets are and have coordination centers and have dashboards that say, there's um, three NICU beds uh, at Beaumont. And so, we can send those babies there, um, or there's four PICU beds. And so we're attempting to do this in a concept we call the Pediatric Care Coordination Center, that this is, would be just like setting up a coordination center for burn surge, which we do here at, at Michigan Medicine. We are the state burn surge coordination center. If we had a surge of sick children and we were running out of ICU beds, running out of assets, could we stand up a group of experts to coordinate the care of children across the state or the region so we don't have to go into crisis standards. Because if you actually look at it, most frontline staff are woefully underinformed about this. And so we need to avoid it and we need to plan for it. So pediatric surge planning is actually a, a strategy that would get us to the point where if I can care for a child that generally would be in an ICU at, at Mott, and I can at least coach some uh, someone through 
their ICU care through telemedicine, for example, which is one of the uh, research projects I run is disaster telemedicine. Could we care for more children um, in, in the state of Michigan and have surge planning and have sheltering in place? This very busy slide, please do not try to uh, memorize this, but this is the interconnectedness between the individual provider, the facility or health system, the coalition or state, and the and national government. Can people anticipate, recognize, use the technology that we have? For example, telemedicine. Um, I participated in an exercise where we did speed dating with experts and a needful doc could speed date, find the right expert and be hooked up in a critical emergency. I was playing the part of a, a field clinician who needed help doing a burn, uh, an uh, escherotomy on a burn patient. And I was able to speed date and get a video consult and do my escherotomy. These are the systems we need to set up so that we can spread that expertise across a state or a region so a, a child doesn't have to um, deteriorate in an outside hospital. And because they can't be transported immediately, they simply deteriorate or die. We, could, we have the tools to do this. Um, we are working at the state level. This is almost, uh, it's mature, nearly done. Caldoun sought and signed off on the mother document. And this is a guideline for implementation of crisis or uh, crisis standards and ethical allocation in the state of Michigan. This has been on the books for probably 11 or 12 years, but it need refreshment during COVID. And um, I have uh, championed a pediatric resource for this where the ethos is the duty to plan. You'll see in the right-hand side, the colorful, please don't worry about all the tiny words, but plan. Um, the strategy is to prepare to stay in conventional or contingent and not get into crisis for kids. Have the surge planning, have the expertise, have the speed dating of experts, and have that duty to plan translate into a graceful degradation rather than crisis standards for kids when it doesn't have to be. So I thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna give over to uh, our moderator and I will stop sharing. Well, thanks so much for that, Dr. Lozano. It's really, I think there's a lot of pediatricians on this on this call today and we're, we're happy to hear that you're integrating kids into these statewide frameworks. I'm gonna get right to Dr. Smith, who I introduced previously, who's gonna talk about a few key issues in scarce resource allocation and crisis standards for obstetric patients. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, Roger. That's Roger. good. Thanks. And I'll just, I'm just gonna check that I, I went to slide to the presenter view. Can you still see that? We see you in sort of the full presenter view. You may, if you click the ellipsis, I think you can get to something a little tidier. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. So I, I had no disclosures. Disclosure. I'll tell you that, um, uh, I'll start with saying I, I, I have no training in, in ethics. I'm a generalist, ob -GYN, and I'm here today really just to share several stories, uh, share some of the experiences of the birth center. First, in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in the beginning back in April 2020, and, th and then in managing a post-COVID birth surge that started in, in May and June of, of this year. I um, have a background in quality, and I've been the OB service chief for, for a while, and I became uh, the co-medical director of the birth center uh, in March, uh, right as the pandemic was starting. So our, our um, a colleague uh, left to relocate, and I had the opportunity to uh, to d jump right in along with with Cosby and Devin. So um, we we have a little bit to inform uh, crisis standards, but not a whole lot. Our our college, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, ACOG, uh, has this document, but it's pretty pretty high level, uh, pretty porous, and not entirely informative at uh, uh, for, for something like the COVID pandemic. We did have a lot of resources um, from the very beginning from, our, from that college, ACOG, and also from the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, SMFM, who had really timely and uh, helpful information to, to help us set standards, um, both ab not in just caring for pregnant patients with COVID, but in um, setting priorities and, and helping um, helping prioritize um, the kinds of things that should get 
should get uh, care first. Um, beginning back in March and April of 2020, in an effort to keep people uh, safe at home, um, as we all know, a lot of care uh, that was considered elective, or at least not urgent, was, was delayed. Uh, scheduled non-urgent surgeries across the system, across uh, most systems, were delayed in order to create space and access and preserve resources for the anticipated uh, COVID surge. Um, an example of um, a, a plan we made to take care of just a, a small segment of our patients had to do with our gynecology patients. So we, we have um, patients with pre-cancer of the cervix who have an abnormal cytology, an abnormal pap test, or uh, are, have been discovered um, by biopsy to have precancer, and now they need some kind of intervention to prevent that from going on to become cancer. We had to make decisions about um, whether their scheduled surgery was truly elective or, or for how long it could be postponed. So with a little bit of national guidance, we put together a, um, an algorithm for who could wait and how long they could wait. So for example, we, we delayed a lot of um, just colposcopies, which is the, the, the next step, the triage of an abnormal pap test by half a year. Uh, we delayed people with uh, adenocarcinoma in situ of the cervix or you know, precancer of the cervix uh, by about three months. Um, and luckily this is a, a precancer of the cervix and cancer of the cervix is a slow growing, uh, usually predictable disease. And, uh, we, we observe no, no harm in delaying this care, no physical harm in delaying this care. Um, as everyone experienced, a lot of our in-person care was transitioned to virtual care um, in order to keep people out of health centers and keep people out of the hospital. We, um, th this is one of the many kind of silver linings of the pandemic that we were able to realize. Um, with the um, great work of uh, a, a colleague in our department, Alex Peel, a lot of work had already been done to um, start to reimagine how prenatal care uh, could look and how it could be prioritized to kind of make the make um, the experience of prenatal care more tailored to patients and their uh, particular risk factors. Uh, forever, prenatal care had been a certain thing that was about 13 visits and about every month and more frequent at the end. And already work had been done to reimagine whether that many visits were the right amount for everybody. Um, and also um, consideration for whether some visits could be uh, virtual, either by phone or by video visits, even before we were forced to, to do that. Now, so that's the, up, the, in the upper left, there's just a paper that was uh, published after the pandemic started, but, uh, but written, written before it started. So this, the pandemic started, we had to convert people to virtual care and we rapidly put the things in place with, the, with of course, a lot of help from, from the institution to do this and to do it uh, well. So we were able to uh, fast track an idea we had been hoping to implement be because of uh, the pandemic. And mainly what we did was reduce by several, by two or three, kind of the standard template for prenatal care visits. Um, to uh, convert several of them from in-person care to virtual care. To, we redefined um, for the pandemic um, and reprioritized some antenatal testing, so fetal testing, um, non-stress testing, and other, um, other tests we do uh, on, on, on the fetus during prenatal care to prioritize who um, st stood to gain the most by these in-person uh, fetal visits. Um, and, and then while we did this, recognizing that um, putting off this visit, delaying this visit, um, putting off this antenatal test could, could, could have a, a bad effect on a baby or a mom, we monitored really closely to, to try to discover if there was a signal of increased uh, fetal demise, uh, stillbirth, uh, delayed diagnosis of preeclampsia, hypertension, and um, and it, it appears that we did not see that signal. Early on in an effort to, uh, in another effort to keep the, the inpatient 
um, space safe to discover uh, who had COVID and how COVID was uh, spreading, universal testing on admission to the hospital was implemented. And we had a unique experience in the birth center. Uh, we observed that in the birth center for our, our pregnant persons, uh, universal testing was not universally embraced. And, and we'll, I'm, I'm just going to um, pose to you some of, some of the reasons we think this occurred. So in the very beginning, when we first had the availability of universal testing, only 50 to 60% of our, of our moms consented to testing. And th this was unique to us. Uh, we don't know for sure. It, it actually seemed to be not just unique to us within Michigan Medicine, but potentially unique to, to us compared to other birth centers. Slowly, the uptake, the, um, the, the, the way that um, moms embraced being tested changed. By July, we were up to 90% of moms consenting to be tested. By November, 95%. And there's a, there was a, at least one really good reason for this hesitancy to be tested. And that's that early on, there, was, there were negative repercussions for learning that one was COVID positive, especially if you didn't have symptoms. So this on the right is uh, an explanation and it's meant to be a, um, a primer, some information for patients about what the consequences of a negative test are. And I know it's too small to read, but what it says is that if you're negative, um, you'll be allowed to have your one visitor, your one support person in labor. If you test positive, uh, you won't be able to have a support person. So that's, that's where we started. There was, a, there was a definite negative consequence to learning that you were COVID positive. So in the beginning, if you were COVID positive, you did not have a support person. We eventually were able to, um, to revisit that policy with the help of um, lots of people thinking about it and with the help of Michigan Medicine leadership. Um, the visitor policy changed after the initial wave was behind us and uh, a, a visitor uh, was allowed. We kind of reconsidered um, the unique importance of birth uh, in the life spectrum. So not unlike end of life care, um, beginning of life care is, is really special and really unique and, and, and different. So um, we advocated uh, to prioritize this and advocated that uh, unlike the rest of the house, that uh, it, was, it was really important for safe care and for support for pregnant moms to have two, two visitors to support people. Um, and we were able to, we were able to, to accommodate that. And, and what we, what we saw was that uh, um, eventually this change in policy, we, we think had a lot to do with, um, or at least a significant, was a significant part of why the uptake in testing increased. So by August, when we changed the policy, uh, if you were COVID positive, instead of having no support people, you could have a support person. Um, and then if you were COVID negative, you could have, you could have two support people. And, and you can see here, this, this, this table I'm showing is, um, spells out what it, what it means if you're COVID positive, COVID negative, or you, or you don't get tested. And you can see that what we did is align um, the care that, was, um, that you were able to get if you were COVID untested um, to be the same as if you were COVID positive. So, so now there was, a, there, was a, there was a good reason to learn that you were COVID negative. I wanna um, draw your attention to the bottom row, postpartum sterilization available to discuss this a little bit. So it, moms who are COVID negative uh, um, could undergo postpartum tubal ligation. Moms who are untested or moms who are COVID positive. In, in the beginning, um, we thought to, to save resources and for a number of reasons, we, we couldn't offer that service to them. Uh, this is of course problematic. Um, sterilization, postpartum sterilization is all, has always been a unique challenge. On one hand, it's, it's an elective procedure. It doesn't have to be performed. There are other alternatives, um, but especially during the pandemic, it, it used extra resources. Uh, this was a time when we were not doing um, scheduled elective uh, surgeries. Um, it, it took extra staff resources. It, it took extra PPE, which in the beginning was, was quite scarce. scarce. Um, it was uh, thought that uh, even in a, uh, 
a, a, a non, uh, in, in a COVID positive patient who wasn't symptomatic, it was, we, th we thought there must be more risks for her to undergo any kind of surgery. Um, so, we, so we had good reasons to, 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 uh, to require that you had a negative COVID test to undergo tubal ligation. But you know, just to talk about tubal ligation more for a minute, it's, it's really not an elective procedure for the families, um, the patients and the families who decide that postpartum sterilization is the best method for them going forward, just by the, um, how it aligns with birth, um, which cannot be completely planned out, it becomes a, um, a, a not elective procedure. Um, there are equity issues involved. So the, the, the mom who plans a postpartum tu tubal ligation, um, besides that there are sound medical reasons to undergo the sterilization immediately after birth compared to doing it several months later by laparoscopy or another method, sometimes it's their only choice because they have health insurance because they're uh, pregnant. And, and um, while there have been in our state mandates to um, avoid taking that away um, uh, for at three months, which was what had been done in the past, um, that can uh, turn into an issue for patients. So this is not a truly elective procedure. So early on, we prioritized accomplishing postpartum tubal ligation on our, on our COVID negative patients. Um, we had a, a really interesting, really tough uh, case early on of, of a, where a, a, a mom had planned to have postpartum sterilization throughout her pregnancy. Um, and when she came in for care, she, it was important to her not to be tested. And early on, we um, decided that it was reasonable to, to deny her um, the ability to have that postpartum sterilization done. And, and that's really problematic. And she appropriately pushed back and I'm sure we could have uh, handled it differently and hand, handled it better. So um, I'll just talk for a couple more minutes and uh, address uh, the, the COVID surge. So after this um, initial, uh, all the planning and all the work that went into um, trying to safely manage the birth center response to the COVID pandemic, and and, and of course, I, you know, I haven't said the obvious, which is that, um, you know, births don't stop. Um, <laughs> they're all going to happen. So while the rest of the many services in the hospital were um, not doing routine care and and or diverting their usual work towards uh, other contributions, nothing really changed in the birth center. The patients kept coming and we kept doing births. Um, what we observed and what everyone observed was that a lot of people delayed uh, childbearing, delayed getting pregnant. A lot of people moved away uh, who were uh, um, in, in, in Ann Arbor with all the graduate students and, and so on. People moved away and for a while we saw decreased births and then we saw a surge in births that began in, in uh, May of this year and really um, peaked in June and, and continues, albeit in a manageable way to now. Um, so this is, this is a busy table, but I'll just point out that in June, we had 523 births, which for us is almost 20% more than a, a usual June um, and more than 15% more than our previous record month. So a lot of births for us. Um, we, we did a lot of work with a lot of help and support from Michigan Medicine Leadership to be prepared for this. Um, it, it was amazing how much work it took to, to be ready to, to manage the surge. And mostly what we did uh, was to gain some, some more beds. So we, we, we always operate right on the margin of the capacity of our birth center. So adding 20% more births um, puts us well beyond that capacity. So we, we spilled over into the eighth floor is, is mainly what we did. But I just wanna bring up one, one thing, tell one story to, to kind of paint the picture of, of, of what we experienced. I know this is busy and, and this is a simplified version of a, a detailed algorithm for how to, um, how to place patients when the birth center or our OB triage, which is like an emergency room is overflowing. We're not used to this. We have enough beds and we, we triage our patients and then decide if they're going home or if they're being admitted for birth. We, we don't experience what emergency rooms experience all the time, which is that surges happen and patients will be wherever they need to be in stretchers and hallways or wherever. So I'm just, I just wanna point out to here that we made a contingency plan for having laboring moms in the hallway. These are the red, uh, the red boxes that say stretcher on here um, in order to be uh, able to, uh, accommodate when we when we didn't have enough beds. 
what we ended up experiencing was, was uh, that very few of our patients had to uh, labor in the hallways of the birth center, but many of them did have to have their birth uh, not in the labor delivery postpartum beautiful uh, rooms we have uh, with tubs and showers and, and so on, but rather um, in our OB triage, which, which is still pretty nice, but not what anyone who spends nine months planning to deliver at our awesome facility plan. So in June, for instance, when we had a really busy month of 523 births, we had 21 births um, that took place in triage because there were no beds for our patients that ended up being about 4% of our births, which is um, um, this big bar right here. So more than we would, we would ever see in a, in a typical, even busy month. I think I'll actually stop there so that we, um, so that it, we don't run out of time, but I look forward to questions if we have time for them. Thanks, Dr. Smith. I know I have, I have several, um, having been on the receiving end of that, that surge. Um, if you'll stop sharing, we'll let Carly pull up her slides. So Dr. Pfeiffer is going to bring us home talking about children with um, congenital heart disease. Thank you. Are you seeing like the full screen? No, we've got you in sort of the... Okay, so something, here we go. Is it still the, which side are you seeing now? Well, we see your slides the way we saw Dr. Smith. I think okay, there how we about go. that? There you go. <laughs> I can work the tech. <laughs> so this is better. All right, so I'm gonna, you know, just breeze through some real kind of more specific um, pediatric cardiology things that came up during the pandemic and then hopefully leave some time for the question. So um, I just wanted to start out with, with talking about just a few cases that um, came up and I talked with colleagues and got these, remembered some of the situations that came up during the pandemic. Um, and this first one is really just, kind of our classic baby born with major congenital heart disease, in this case, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And this is a baby who's had their first surgery. Um, they're supposed to have three surgeries and they now have a shunt dependent physiology and living life um, that way and are scheduled to get their surgery standard of care by five months of age. And we know kind of best case scenario, they get that. And if we wait longer, there's definite increase risk of a sudden demise or a sudden event. Um, but in the height of the pandemic, this is the kind of case that was considered elective or maybe urgent, but certainly not emergent. So these cases all pretty much got canceled for a period of time. And in this particular case, this was delayed about a month and did eventually get back on the schedule as soon as we had some ORs and staff for them and uh, ability to do more surgeries. And this patient made it to that second surgery with no obvious negative effects on outcome. Um, but I think what's really hard in our patient population is that it's really almost impossible to predict that risk by waiting. And if we're wrong, the risk is, is uh, obviously very severe. So the second case is a little bit similar. This is a baby with complex disease that eventually was gonna have a full repair. Um, had the same shunt physiology, was doing well, and standard of care would have been to do this full heart repair, which was quite complex at around six months of age. But at the height of the pandemic, again, this was considered elective. The baby was doing well at home, um, but did present with worsening cyanosis and felt to move into the urgent category and need an intervention. And luckily we were able to provide surgery but the decision was made for this baby to change the plan because the surgery they would have had would have potentially required ECMO. And we've learned about that being a limited resource for sure in the height of the pandemic in particular. So this baby actually underwent another palliative surgery rather than the full repair and did okay with that, but had a, an additional open heart surgery and did not get the full surgery until many months later. So this was definitely a change in what we normally would do. And this third case I really like because it's not a baby with complex major disease, but this is a teenager who has SVT, which is a pretty common, pretty what we consider, you know, maybe, you know, something that many people live with without problems, but she had a pretty significant case of this. 
And standard of care would have been her to undergo an elective ablation procedure, which is usually curative. But this, of course, got delayed as it was elective. And this patient actually showed up in the emergency room during the pandemic, in the height of the pandemic, because they had SVT. And, you know, the question is, could that patient have been exposed to COVID and that, you know, could have been disastrous for this particular patient. So just some examples of some of the things we faced in, in pediatric cardiology. Um, I did find this one article here, which talks about uh, in cardiology, and this is adult cardiology, the forced choices that need to be made. And I just put down here some of the, uh, you know, really important points that came out of this paper. Uh, you know, so the halt on non-emergency clinical care forces cardiologists to make these decisions, as we've heard today, um, and which patients need the urgent and emergent procedures and which ones can be delayed without excessive risk. Um, I think that's extremely difficult in the pediatric cardiology population. Um, we know that delays or absence of treatment that can then um, lead to avoidable harm and deaths. And during the crisis, we have to shift from this optimizing care for everyone to care that saves the most lives. And then they advocate for fair approaches to triaging patients and allocating limited resources to patients that most likely will benefit. And this all is very, very standard. But I think that with children with congenital heart disease, this is extremely difficult. So, you know, we know that our patients will require resource intensive procedures we know that most congenital heart patients, their care is not emergent the way that we strictly would define that. And actually a lot of the patients that were scheduled for urgent and elective procedures were doing, seem to be doing quite well at home or maybe in the hospital, but not needing anything right now. Um, but I think this gives us a false sense of security that we're doing okay by waiting. And I think that the other, you know, issue with our patients is that most will not have a poor outcome from that delay or change of care. And we actually know that many of them did okay by waiting. Um, but, you know, I think the concern is that overall risk to that particular individual may be low, but if it happens, it's, it's very severe. And I think with congenital heart disease, the real difficulty we have is that our patient population is so diverse and so um, you know, broad in terms of the complexity and what we're doing, it's not really uniform and we can't really compare apples to apples. And that's even within cardiology. Um, so, you know, just to kind of move on to the allocation of scarce resources, I think that the real big difficulty we saw was that, you know, we're comparing an infant with complex congenital heart disease to an adult with advanced COVID. And those are just two completely different diseases, completely different services, hospitals, you know, and I think when you, we try to compare to figure out where we're gonna allocate the scarce resources, it becomes quite difficult. So I don't have the answers. Um, I think as care providers of children, we just have a responsibility to advocate for our patients with complex yet treatable disease. And, you know, every subspecialty is doing the same thing. Um, you know, we know that infants with chronic disease that have it treated appropriately have a long, meaningful life ahead of them, you know, in many cases. We know that if we do these procedures at the optimal time, that's going to give them the best outcomes. And we know that elective procedures become emergent often if we wait long enough. Um, outcomes are not typically all or nothing. Um, many patients survive if the intervention is delayed and we don't really necessarily see negative outcomes, but certainly there may be longer term negative outcomes. And I really think, you know, we have to remember the potential life loss that when we have our children with, with chronic disease, that long-term outcomes and potential life loss are of utmost importance when we discuss the benefit to the child in this case. So love to uh, answer any questions, but hopefully we have time for that. We do have a few. Um, and while I wait to see what comes up in the, in the um, Q and A, all of your talks were really excellent, but I'd like to start with a question for Dr. Smith. When we think about sort of what's changing and what standard of care is, and I think about, the modern emphasis on experience, family-centeredness, baby-friendly, when we think about what people are looking for when they have, say, a term-healthy baby in the hospital. 
and how much of, you know, we're not, we weren't talking necessarily about offering a change in the, say, like standards of care for appropriately delivering an infant, but thinking about what is a sort of standard expectation for, for the environment of delivering that infant. And that seems like something you guys had to grapple with quite a bit. Yeah, we definitely had to grapple with that. And I'll say that I think we had it easy in that regard because we still live in this big, new, amazing space whose triage rooms are, you know, you know nicer and bigger than some um, birthing rooms in, in some older hospitals. Uh, so we had to, we, we were pretty certain we were providing safe care. And at least in the beginning, we were appropriately staffed. So kind of the worst case for many of those deliver and triage patients was simply, you know, the room's not as beautiful as our big rooms. That's still a problem. Um, but, but I think we had it easy that way. Thanks. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Lozon, I wondered if you could comment, and then I'll add, there's one uh, question in the chat I want to get to also, but if you could comment just a little about when you think about transfers and children, and this sort of special status we seem to grant what some people refer to as last ditch or heroic care for children. And the, the sort of willingness I think we have to reassure parents that they've left no stone unturned, even if the odds of that, of there being something fruitful under that stone being low. And I wonder if you could talk just for a minute about whether our approach to say to referrals for that kind of last ditch care had to change or should change. Um, during the worst of it, um, we, we simply behaved as normal. And frankly, the worst of the COVID phase one, when I was in the command center and, and the command center was open and, um, the, we are, we are actually having more trouble right now. Those of you who are in the CNW space know that we are dying, we are dying right, now. right now, um, uh, sorry about my echo. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, we're just dying right now because of no beds in the hospital. And um, one of the things that we do have to, we are explicitly asked not to take certain transfers on certain days during certain hours, but it's very, very difficult. If, if I'm called in the ED and there's a kid um, that is something only we can uniquely care for, like some of Carly's patients. If that child is up at Traverse City and needs to come down, that's our kid. We have a fiduciary to that kid, even though sometimes I wonder, can we safely care for that kid in the crazy environment we're in right now? I mean, the children's hospital's jam-packed full. Um, when I worked Sunday night, we had negative three ICU beds, meaning we were delivering ICU care in the ER, and it was not pretty. So if I bring another child into this space, is that going to be safe and best of care? And what if we had an extended period of time? What if there was no relief from that and it was worse and worse and worse? And somebody who clearly had a non-survivable injury or condition, would I, tr would I put the helicopter in the air? And would I put us at more risk for that? I don't know what I would do. And we have created some artificial ask the super AOD, the admitting officer of the day, what you should do. We've created some artificial get out of jail free cards for ourselves by creating some of these structures. Yes, they're to help triage patients to get the best, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number. But I just worry that those are single threaded. And I don't know that in real time, we, those of you who are on SRAC know that we discussed this admitting officer of the day concept very early last, you know, a year and a half ago when the command center opened, are we, are we rationing care by saying yes to certain things and no to other things? How do we know that's an ethical construct? So I can't tell you for certain that it is every day all the time, but we do create um, triage and transfer um, it aided by the fact that if we have the ability to give the care, um, it felt we would be um, violating federal law if we didn't, EMTALA that is. So this is very, very hard and um, I, I have no good answer for it, but there are gonna be times we, we constantly are asked to be the ones to just simply declare the child deceased. They'll have a, a scene call or a child who's been you know, injured gravely and um, maybe was arrested and, but we're gonna be the one to make that 
you know, end of life decision in our PICU because we we have good good surrounding care. We have palliative care. We have good PICU doctors. But there there might come a time where we can't do that if we get into a crisis situation. I hope that partially answered your question, Naomi. Question, Naomi. It does. Thank you. Um, and I, I have a question for Dr. Pfeiffer as well. And this is gets a little more into sort of the 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 real human practice base of this. Like if I think about your second case where a different surgery was done. Can you give us a flavor of what, and I don't know if you're the one who had that conversation with the family, but what that conversation was like and how you approach like when you're dealing with individual patients or being, or parents who are being told these things, how you, how your, the congenital heart center has dealt with that. Yeah, I mean, I was not the person involved with that case. I think that it was, you know, what we tried to do with a lot of these, you know, re recalling back to that time was as a group um, of, uh, you know, faculty and care providers, you know, including surgeons and the cardiologists and the nurse practitioners caring for these patients to really kind of get a core group of people together to discuss kind of what the best option going forward is and who really needed to be done soon and who would be best to wait. And we did our best to try to um, you know, figure out who was going to be okay waiting. And in this case, this patient needed something more urgently. And I think um, the concern was that we weren't going to be able to provide potentially ECMO support. And that would be a worse outcome, obviously, if we couldn't do that and it was needed. So this was the safest option moving forward and was a good option. I mean, it wasn't the optimal option, but was something that we knew the baby could do well with. So although I wasn't involved in those discussions, I think it, you know, it was a, a typical discussion of, you know, what do we have to work with? What are the um, factors in this particular patient? And then, you know, what's the best plan going forward? Well, thanks very much to all three of you for giving up some of your time. I know you spend most of it in the trenches, so I really appreciate you giving us some of it to address this large group of attendees. And I wish we had time for more questions and discussions because this has been really thought provoking. Um, I will reshare my slides with the QR code again um, and uh, so that people can get that if they didn't get it at the beginning. And thanks very much again to our panelists.